Well, we're in uh, 2 Kings, in the fifth session. We're going to cover uh, chapters 14 through 16 in this session. And uh, just by way of your review, you may recall that 1 Kings took us through uh, a portion of both the kingdoms. Uh, we're in 2 Kings, of course. The, the northern kingdom goes from bad to worse, and we're going to see it uh, uh, end tonight. Uh, it it uh, lasted for about two centuries. The uh, southern kingdom had some kings. Each one had about 20 kings, but the, and uh, the kings of the uh, northern kingdom went from bad to worse. But for the, in the southern kingdom, about half of them weren't that bad, and there were several that were pretty good. So they have a little different history, a little longer history, but they ultimately go into captivity also. And we're going to be looking at the segment from Amaziah to Ahaz in the uh, southern kingdom and from uh, Joash to uh, Pekah in the, in the northern kingdom. And uh, the northern kingdom um, had two kings that were very dominant. All of them were not that it was, all of them were bad in many respects, but both Jehu and Jeroboam. We'll talk a little bit about them as we go. But something else we haven't talked too much about, but we should recognize that there were prophets. Uh, God, in his desire that they repent and to try to avert judgment, sent one prophet after another. And uh, we uh, focused on Elijah and Elisha, of course, but there were others, and we're going to uh, look closely at the last three. Uh, there are also a group of prophets uh, in the southern kingdom. We've seen four so far. There'll be four more coming later. But the ones I'm going to talk a little bit about will be the last three, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea, uh, as we get into that. But to summarize what, what they accomplished, looking ahead a few chapters, in 2 Kings 17, it summarizes it for us, as they forsook all the commands of the Lord, their God, and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves, and the Asherah pole, and they bowed down to all the starry hosts, and they worshipped Baal. And they sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire, and they practiced divination and sorcery, and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. I've ex I just excerpted a few, a few of these verses. We're going to see the same echo all the way through the history of especially the northern kingdom, despite God's continued patient efforts of sending them one, one after the other, uh, warnings through the prophets, but they didn't listen. They continued to offend him by their conduct. So let's get into it. Let's go to uh, 2 Kings 14. And, but let's start our, uh, by taking a look at the southern kingdom. We're going to talk about the southern kingdom. So it's 2 Kings 14, starting off in verse 1. In the second year of Joash, the son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah. In other words, all the way through the text, we'll try to identify a king, but relate it to the king that's reigning at the same time in the uh, opposing kingdom, if you will. And so Amaziah, he was, uh, uh, by the way, his name means his help is Yah. He has another name too, Uzziah. You'll find uh, in the book of Isaiah, he speaks, he uses his other name. Uh, Azariah means my, uh, my help is Yah or Yahweh. Um, his other name, Uzziah, means my strength is Yahweh. It doesn't show up in the transliterations, but that's, both names are, in a sense, in the, especially in the Hebrew, essentially equivalent. So he was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehodan of Jerusalem. And so he's fairly young, 25 years old, when he became king. And he rules a long time, about 29 years. And uh, much of this time, uh, his son Azariah's reign will overlap with his own. They'll overlap for some reasons you'll see too, uh, when we get to it. And he did that was, which, that was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father. We're going to find that's a very frequent echo of the southern kingdom. They don't do too badly, but they don't do what, uh, everything they should. So he did that what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did much that was good, in other words. Yet not like David his father. He did according to all the things as Joash his father did. Howbeit the high places were not taken away, as yet the people did sacrifice and burnt incense in the high places. And so this is part of the problem. On the one hand, they, these uh, kings will, uh, would encourage some proper worship on the one hand, and yet they didn't get rid of the evil places. See, when you hear about these tribes being, or these people being uh, idolaters, it's not like they didn't worship God. They just included all their other gods in the mix. And that still offends God. God does not want to be number one on a list of ten. He wants to be number one on a list of one. And uh, we need to get that across. Now, when you hear about these high places, these were elevations that were set aside for pagan worship. 
Each contained altars of various kinds for various uh, pagan idols. And sometimes the Hebrews also would set aside a high place for worship of the Lord and would ordain local priests. Now this was in direct violation of the Torah, which insisted on a single center for worship, namely Jerusalem. And uh, secondly, uh, on a priesthood that's staffed by descendants of Aaron, Moses' brother. It's expressed in the Torah. When they don't do that, they're not following directions. And one thing we should get across to ourselves as we go through the Bible from end to end, God means what he says and says what he means. And God is very specific in, as to uh, uh, what he expects. And that's one of the reasons the book of Leviticus is one of the most important books in the Bible. It's the only book in the Bible on holiness. And it's often... Uh, 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 not studied or not understood because it, it takes some, it's not a book you just read, you really need to study it. But God is very, very specific and in every, in every detail there is for our learning. In Romans 15, 4, Paul points that out. That whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning and uh, so forth. Uh, okay, so getting at verse 5, it came to pass as soon as the kingdom was confirmed in his hand, he slew his servants which had slain the king his father. And the children of the murderers he slew not, According to that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, nor the children be put to death for the fathers, for every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So this in Deuteronomy 24, 16 uh, um, is, you know, is, is uh, quite explicit about that. Now, it's interesting, the very fact that we have a citation here in this book uh, from the law of Moses is evidence that Deuteronomy is not a late composition as some of the liberal, so-called liberal um, uh, uh, critics uh, try to uh, maintain. That's just not true. It obviously was old e at, even at, at this time and so forth. Okay, verse 7, And he slew of Edom in the Valley of Salt 10,000 and took Selah by war and called the name of it Joktil to this day. Now, um, this war with Edom that's underway here is more fully described in 2 Chronicles 25 for those that want to get into more background. And it was an unprovoked uh, uh, act of war on Edom, showing somewhat uh, Amaziah's arrogance and cruelty, if you will. And it was just one more step in, in Judah's um, downward um, pro uh, progression to her destruction. But uh, one of the things that he does that's uh, a bad scene is that he takes the gods that he picks up from Edom to Jerusalem and he worships them there. And that's all in 2 Chronicles 25. And uh, let's see, Edom had it revolted from the Judean control during the reign of Jehoram and uh, he wanted to regain the control of, uh, of Edom because it gave access to, uh, to Judah of the southern trade routes. And so uh, he, it speaks of Selah here, which uh, the name Joktiel by Amaziah, but it's later named Petra and a stronghold of the city of Edom. It's one of the things that's carved out of a rock. It's one of the must-see things, if you get a chance to, in Israel. It's on the Jordan side, of course, but it's worth doing. Uh, because, not only because of its historic, it's, it's an incredible place to visit, very historically relevant, but even perhaps more important, it's prophetically relevant. And if you want to know more about that, we have a briefing pack called uh, the, uh, the Next Holocaust and the Refuge in Edom, which deals with Petra or Selah, as it's called here, uh, in terms of its uh, prophetic future. But moving along, then Amaziah sent messengers Jeho to Jehoash, who, uh, the, the son of Jehoahaz, uh, the son of Jehu, the king of Israel, saying, Come, let us look one another in the face. His, this arrogance that he has uh, is going to get him in trouble with the northern kingdom, partly because of the, uh, his worship of Edomite, by, Edomite gods. He's going to get, uh, God is going to uh, judge him. And so he's challenging the northern kingdom to a war, um, which incident had just recently uh, suffered defeats from the from Hazazel, the the um, uh, what we would call the Syrians or Ar the Arameans. So Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, "The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife.' And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon that trod down the thistle. He's saying, "What on earth is that all about?" It's he's dealing in sort of a riddle or a parable. See, he's, he's, the, king, the, Israel, the northern king, uh, king is responding um, uh, as a warning to Amaziah. The, 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 uh, the thistle and cedars were common in Lebanon, but here Amaziah is the thistle and Jehoash is the cedar. And as a wild beast could easily squash a thistle, so anyone can easily defeat Judah 
is what he's implying by this little rhetoric here. And uh, thou hast indeed smitten Edom, and thine heart hath lifted thee up. Glory of this, and tarry at home. For why shouldest thou meddle to thy hurt, that thou shouldest fall, even thou and Judah with thee? In other words, he's saying, just be, you, know, you just conquered Edom. Be satisfied with that. Glory in it, but stay at home. Don't bite off something you can't chew is, in effect, the flavor of this. But the problem is, is that Amaziah is hurt. The pride was hurt. And uh, so his he's feelings are hurt. So he's, uh, uh, he's committing himself even more strongly to war. It's probably, all this is being probably orchestrated by God, who is anxious to see Amaziah cut down because of his embracing these Edomite idols. He brought those back to Jerusalem and so forth. So uh, it's interesting, the, the writer of the text it constantly selects things and so forth to make his point, a key theme here, all the way through here, isn't how powerful these kings were in, tim, tim, in terms of their conquests or their buildings, all that sort of stuff, the way we usually measure maybe a, the reign of a king. It's measured in spiritual terms. And uh, so Amaziah is going to get, get uh, uh, it's going to, get, going to be in trouble. He says, Therefore, the Joash, the king of Israel, went up, and he and Amaziah, the king of Judah, looked one another in the face, as they say, at Beth Shemesh, which belongeth to Judah. And Judah was put to the worse before Israel, and they fled every man to their tents. And uh, so obviously that was Amaziah, part of his coming down. So Joash, the king of Israel, took Amaziah, the king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Ahaziah at Beth Shemesh, Beth Shemesh and came to Jerusalem and broke, broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim unto the corner gate, 400 cubits. This is one of the places in the scripture where the northern kingdom actually attacks the southern kingdom and actually attacks Ju uh, Jerusalem. And uh, he's, uh, he broke down about 600 feet of the city wall at Jerusalem. And he took all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord uh -oh, and in the treasures uh, of the king's house and hostages and returned to Samaria. So this is sort of surprising. This is one of those places where even though the northern kingdom is not in good shape with respect to God, God still uses them to, to, uh, to uh, get the attention of the southern kingdom here. And, it, and they get one of these summary verses then in verse 50. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, which he did, and his might, and how he fought with Amaziah, the king of Judah, are they not written in the book of Chronicles, the kings of Israel? Indeed they are, of course. And uh, so now apparently when Amaziah was taken prisoner, the, uh, his, his son, Azariah, began to reign in, as Judah's king in Jerusalem. And so that's one of the reasons trying to lay out the chronology of kings gets very complicated because they often overlap. And here's one of the many places where they do. Now this mentions the death here, applies the death here of, of uh, Joash in verse 15. It's the second mention of Joash's death. You may, you may recall that echoes from chapter 13. It seems to be added here because of the unusual situation that existed when Amaziah was being held prisoner. And uh, so when Joash dies, Amaziah will be released and returned to Judah. And, and uh, Joash's successor uh, was, uh, was his son, Jeroboam II. Jeroboam II is a very, very key player in the, in the history of the northern kingdom. Verse 16, And Joash slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. And Jeroboam, his son, reigned in his stead. This is Jeroboam the second. Remember, the northern kingdom got its start under Jeroboam the first when he rebelled against Rehoboam. But um, this guy is named after him. He would be identified, if, it, if uh, denotated with Jeroboam the second. And, and, and he's going to end up being a very, very powerful king and uh, lead the northern kingdom to tremendous material prosperity which does nothing more than highlight their spiritual bankruptcy, as we shall see. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, lived after the death of Joash, the son of Joash, uh, king of Israel, uh, 15 years. And the rest of the acts of Amaziah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? Uh, uh, and uh, so forth. Now, let's see. Um, now, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, and they uh, sent after him to Lachish and slew him there. And uh, so... We don't know who actually was in the conspiracy, but in any case, uh, uh, he was trying to fly, flee the country if his enemies had not caught up with him first. And uh, they brought him on horses, and he was buried at Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. That's the royal section, if you will, the ancient city of David. And all the people of Judah took Azariah, which was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. Now, they'd overlap while Amaziah was a prisoner and so forth, but Azariah still only 16, but that's not... not 
a young age in that culture. This is, I mean, it's not as young as it would seem in our culture, of course. But, uh, and he built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. The, the restoration of Elath on the coast of uh, the Gulf of Aqaba is probably mentioned here because it's one of his most significant achievements. More information on Azariah will be given in the first seven verses of the chapter 15 when we get there. But, uh, but we get this editorial comment. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel a sin. Here's a, a, a reflexive remark back to the original Jeroboam that started the northern kingdom. In other words, he started this idolatry. And like most of the, virtually all the kings that succeed him, not just in his dynasty. We're going to talk, you know, about four or five, six dynasties here before long. He said that, that the succeeding kings, they did evil uh, in the sight of the Lord. They did what offended God because they didn't depart from the cultural tradition that Jeroboam started, one of idolatry. And uh, he restored the coast of Israel from entering of Hamath into the Sea of the Plain, according to the word of God. Israel, which he spake by the hand of a servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath -hefer. Now here is an interesting um, uh, reference to the Jonah that you and I know, interestingly enough. This territorial expansion was prophesied by Jonah, it says here. It's not recorded anywhere else in the scripture, uh, it's, but, it, but it helps date Jonah himself because we know what time the prophecy was given here because it's record recorded here. And so this is the same Jonah that traveled to Nineveh, and we'll talk about him a little bit further. We're going to summarize three key prophets, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea, at the end of this uh, chapter. But uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's important to back up a little bit and give you some background about Jeroboam II, because he's a very, very key player. He was the fourth in the Jehu's line. Uh, he, um, the Old Testament doesn't say much about him, actually. Passing rather quickly over him here for verses from 23 to 29, but in a brief mention in Chronicles chapter 5, 1 Chronicles chapter 5. But we know from archaeology that Jeroboam II was a very vital and very aggressive ruler. And his, the later reign of Jeroboam II ushers in a time of exploding prosperity for Israel. Um, he had destroyed the uh, military power of Syria and allowed him to expand his kingdom all the way to Damascus. Uh, even taking over the capital of, Met, uh, of Aram, uh, as it was called in those days, Damascus. And, uh, and so because he that, took advantage of all the, uh, the trade routes then, that made the northern kingdom rich. They were very, very wealthy. But the concentration of wealth also brings corruption. Heavier and heavier taxes uh, were laid on the workers. The wealthy became land hungry, and they squeezed out the small farmers, building great estates. Most of the poor were forced to sell themselves uh, and, and raised their families as bond servants on the very lands that they previously owned. Even small merchants were corrupted, um, cheating with the way they weighted uh, their weights and measures. Um, and uh, this is all accelerated by the corruption of the justice system, where the, the judges took bribes from the rich, and, and this increasingly put oppression on the poor. All this comes up in great pain and suffering in, in, the, in the indictments of the prophets, all three of them. Uh, well, especially uh, Amos and Hosea, but Jonah also. And uh, there's no sense of responsibility to the poor. And all of this, uh, the, uh, Amos hurls an angry charge. These people are willing to sell the needy for a pair of sandals. It was just, uh, just injustice everywhere. And uh, in other words, luxury footwear meant more to them than the suffering of a fellow human being. And so religiously, economically, politically, they became an unjust society. In 2 Kings 17, when we get there, there's a couple of verses, 13, 14, summary. Let me just give it to you. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all the prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance with my, the entire law I commanded your fathers to obey that I delivered you through my servants, the prophets. But they wouldn't listen. So uh, the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up nor left nor any helper to Israel. In verse 27, okay, um, and the Lord said not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. We're going to discover that the Lord gets to the same point a hundred years later with the southern kingdom. But he doesn't blot them out because of his promise to David. But the northern kingdom didn't have that promise. So he's, you know, that was a commitment to Judah. But let's move on here. 
Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did in his might, how he warred and how he recovered Damascus and Hamath, which belonged to Judah or Israel, are they not written in the book of Chronicles, the kings of Israel? So here we have, uh, you know, that wrap-up kind of verse. Um, I might point out that when you take the territory that uh, Jeroboam uh, recovered and uh, it made Israel the largest country on the eastern Mediterranean seacoast. And when you take the prosperity of the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom together, they approximate what Solomon had. They, they, together they had, although uh, the, the southern kingdom is about a third the size of the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is much, much larger. I didn't get time to put a map in the slides. I probably should have. Now, one reason Jeroboam II was so successful is because Damascus had been weakened by attacks from further east, namely the Assyrians. Don't confuse the Assyrians with Aram, which we call Syria typically. Sometimes even the Bible would call it Syria. Don't confuse Syria with Assyria, the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were already starting to put heat on Aram, and that's why uh, Jeroboam was able to take advantage of that. And uh, he was a very, his, his father had been a very, very shrewd military strategist, and so was he. Apparently in, inherited those abilities. And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, even with the kings of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, reigned in his stead. And I might mention, by the way, it's in Jeroboam's second reign that we find the prophets Amos and Hosea ministering in Israel. Both Amos and Hosea came from the southern kingdom, but were sent by God to the northern kingdom to give, to give them God's message. And so their messages also give us a further insight into the reign, what, what the conditions were like in the, uh, under the reign of Jeroboam and so forth. In fact, uh, this is probably a good time to just take a look at the prophets uh, that went to the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom had four up till now. There's going to be four more coming that we'll talk, we'll summarize them later. But it's these three, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea, that are in focus in the time that we're looking at right now. Now, Jonah is widely misunderstood. We all know about Jonah. Who, uh, he was called to go to Nineveh, and uh, he was uh, uh, very reluctant to go because he was a patriot. Many people don't understand his mindset. And uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was a patriot, and that's why he was reluctant. If you look at Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, it explains that Jonah was afraid that the people of Nineveh, Nineveh might heed him and repent. And he didn't want him to repent. He wanted God to wipe him out because he knew that it was ultimately Nineveh was not only an enemy of Israel, but he also knew they would ultimately be the instrument of their undoing, which they were ultimately. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And so he, he, he didn't... Uh, you know, you know the story. He got, he got told him to go there, and he he went as fast as far away as he could in the other direction until God explained it to, to him a little more clearly. And then he, uh, when he finally does go there, he goes there with a reluctant message. You know, forty days and you get yours. And uh, uh, but the the amazing thing, of course, is that they did repent. And when they do repent, Jonah is in a big pout. You wonder what's chapter four for? It's a great story. Chapters one, two, and three. You get to the fourth chapter. What's it there for? Job is pouting. He's upset. He didn't want to repent. Now he's discouraged, and he's you know he's on a slump on a hill overlooking the city and so forth. If you're going to understand uh, Jonah's ministry, you need to see his entire adventure as God's object lesson, not to Nineveh, to Israel. He is showing them that if they repent, that um, they could be saved. See, the whole point of the Nineveh story is that they repented. They did it on spec, by the way. There was no promise. Jonah didn't give me a promise. Hey, if you repent, God's going to forgive you. I mean, he's going to uh, say, uh, 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 deliver you. They did it on spec, but they did. They did repent, and it, God had decreed 40 days, and they, they were ground zero. And in those 40 days, the king went down, they repent, and God spares them. The point, it's a lesson to the northern kingdom. Pay attention, guys. Northern kingdom had 200 years and blew it. Nineveh had 40 days and, 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 and repented. So, and so, but despite the example of Nineveh, the people of Israel just wouldn't respond to the prophets. And it was their failure to repent that made judgment inevitable. Let's talk a little bit about Amos. Here's a guy that most, uh, most commentators feel is very poor. He, was, he raised sycamore figs, which was, which was not a, a, a high economic calling, but we don't know that he might not have been a landowner doing that, because he's from Judah, not from the northern kingdom. But he's generally viewed as a poor. Uh, but he certainly has a burden for the poor as he goes 
to the northern kingdom. He, he may have been just a, 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 you know, a caretaker of figs and, and, and uh, caring for sheep and all that sort of thing. And uh, so he was not really in the office of a prophet, nor was he uh, the son of a prophet. He just responded to God's call. And he obviously went up north. He probably visited Bethel and Dan, saw the calves and all that. He probably walked past the great houses and saw the luxury goods on the one hand uh, in stores, outside of which the poor were uh, crouched. He must have noticed the merchants mixing chaff with the wheat that they were selling, slyly using dishonest weights and the rest of it. And he was angered by the heartlessness and the materialism. So he boldly identifies the sins for which God was about to judge the northern kingdom. And uh, give you just a, uh, I didn't make up slides for these. You can just get a, a, in Amos chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. For, the, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. In verses 6 through 8 here. They sell the righteous for silver, the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. And goes on. And then in chapter 5, he continues, You hate the one who reproves in court and despise him who tells the truth. You trample the poor and force him to give you grain. You oppress the righteous and take bribes. You deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet in such times, for the times are evil. And so based on all of this, uh, the little book of Amos, he, he uh, announces the sure approach of divine judgment. But see, the whole point is that uh, they should have um, known better. Uh, Amos 5 continues, Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good. Maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph, being a, Joseph being an idiom for the northern kingdom here. Well, let's talk. Well, let's just talk. Take the third, one of my favorites. That's Hosea. We don't know a lot about his background. What we do know is rather heart rendering because he was uh, called to suffer the pain of commitment to a faithless wife, a prostitute. God called him to do it, and he did. And uh, the whole experience with Hosea and his harlot uh, that he took for a wife is is in, was intended by God to be a model of Israel. And, uh, and uh, to reveal the meaning of religious apo uh, apostasy. Just as Hosea's wife could not remain faithful to Hosea, uh, likewise Israel didn't remain faithful to God. And the, the model there of a marriage is, is quite vivid. And uh, the, the imagery here of sexual unfaithfulness is very appropriate because that's exactly the way idolatry is treated throughout the scripture as, as virtually synonymous with uh, illicit sex and so forth. And uh, see, because most of the, these pagan um, uh, alternatives were, were very, very, uh, they were basically nature faiths, and all mixed up with fertility and crops and so forth, but tied to, the, to uh, sexually stimulating uh, issues. And the passions were thought to uh, help overflow, to make fertility on the earth. So there's some real um, obscene elements in the pagan worship. It's not just the fact, not as simple as just the fact they worship another god than God. They were uh, very, very offensive forms. So idolatry and sexual promiscuity are very linked in Hosea's day, especially. And so uh, Hosea uh, says things just, just like Amos did. There is no, unfaith there is no faithful faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery, and they break all the bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. You know, one of the things, as we went through Hosea, especially chapters 4 through 14, it's a disturbing to study if you take it seriously because it sounds like America. You start, but the more you read it, the more you think, boy, this is the Northern Kingdom, yes, but boy, does it, does the shoe fit, you know. But it's a, it's a, despite all this, God still continues to pour His love upon Israel, the Northern Kingdom. And uh, Hosea deals with that. In Hosea 11, he says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further he went from me. They sacrificed in the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with the cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from the, uh, their neck and bent down to feed them. God just anguished over this, this uh, unruly child, as he, as he describes it. 
and I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. But see, Israel was unmoved with God's pleas. That's the pain of Hosea as the nation then fails to listen to the, the uh, painful pleas of Hosea on the one hand or the angry denunciations of Amos. And the prophets spoke, but Israel would not hear. And one of the things I encourage you to do is take a look at those passages and judge for yourself if there's a parallel with, uh, with uh, the northern kingdom and America. But uh, let's get on to uh, 2 Kings 15. Let's shift again to the southern kingdom, talk about Azariah. The 20th, 7th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem. Wow, he started young, but lasted quite a while. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. So he reigned a total of 52 years, and uh, that's the longest reign of any uh, king of, uh, of Judah or Israel to that time. And uh, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaz Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. Here it is again. He, he does really well, except he doesn't go quite far enough. Uh, the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. See, the problem isn't just that they're, they're worshiping God in Jerusalem, but they're also worshiping. See, that's the problem we all have, by the way. This all sounds so remote. It's ancient history, whatever. Let's be careful. Because they're worshiping God on the one hand, but they're worshiping a lot of other things too. And one of the things this should call us to do is to examine our lives carefully. Are we, are, are we allowing anything else to... To, to eclipse God in our priorities? Are there other little things we do that are sort of, well, you know, winked at? No, God is very serious. He takes himself very seriously and expects us to take him seriously. Okay, verse 5. And the Lord smote the, and the, Lord smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in the several house, a separate house. And Jotham the king's son was over the house judging the people of the land. So there's an overlap here again. And see, he, uh, uh, what's not recorded here, you have to piece some of this in from Second Chronicles, parallel passages about chapter 26. Um, he, uh, he, he, he's getting very proud, and he intrudes on the priest's office. You may recall that God went to great lengths to keep the royal line and the religious line separate. The royal line was the tribe of Judah, and the priestly line was from the tribe of Levi. They're supposed to be separate. The Levitical priesthood, the Mosaic priesthood, is separate from the royal line of the Messiah. It gets united in the Messiah. There's only, there's only three places in the scripture where we have a king and a priest in the same person. Melchizedek, just a verse or two in Genesis 14, which would go into obscurity if it wasn't for Psalm 110 and some other allusions, and an elaboration in the, in the Epistle of Hebrews. The, the priesthood of Melchizedek is different. It's, remember, Melchizedek is one that Abraham gave tithes to. And the writer of Hebrews makes the point that when Abraham's giving tithes to Melchizedek, Levi is still in his loins. In fact, several generations later. Out of, you follow me? So that, the, argu the rabbinical argument is that that makes Melchizedek senior or more higher than the Aaron or the Mosaic uh, thing in general and, and the priesthood specifically. But they're united in the Messiah. So there's three places. We have Melchizedek was a king and a priest. The Messiah was a king and a priest and will be, continue to be. And who else? Got uh, Melchizedek and Messiah. Anyone? Jesus. Jesus, yes, of course. I'm assuming the Messiah, Jesus. The believers in Christ. Yeah, the church, the ecclesia. We need to understand the uniqueness of the Ecclesia. Not all people saved are in the Ecclesia. You need to do your homework. It's very important. But clearly, the kings and priests, Peter uses that expression of us as believers, and the 24 elders in Revelation, the identity of them is very critical in understanding what's going on there. So anyway, uh, the point is, is that Amaziah intrudes upon the priest's office, and for that, God strikes him as a leper. And uh, it must have broken Isaiah's heart when he died, because Isaiah was afraid that Azariah's um, successors would lead the nation back into idolatry. And uh, so Azariah became a leper in about 750 B.C. So he shared the throne with his son as co-regent until he died, and his son takes over. So 
So Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Jotham the son reigned in his stead. In the 38th year, Azariah the king of Judah did Zechariah the son of Jeroboam reign over Israel. That's in the north now, in Samaria. Uh, and he, he reigned uh, uh, how long? Six months. Big deal, huh? Before we leave Azariah, I might mention he was probably one of Judah's most uh, effective and influential kings in Judah. He expanded the territories outward to Elath. Uh, he fortified Jerusalem and other parts of Judah. And the combined territories of Azariah in the, in the south and Jeroboam in the north approximated those of David and Solomon, just to give you a perspective. But unfortunately, he became proud and, of course, uh, had this leper thing, and he's then humbled by God. So we have Zechariah, who's going to reign all of six months. That's a rather short interlude. And Zechariah did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Shalom, the son of Jabesh, uh, uh, he was, he's, he's going to be assassinated publicly by Shalom. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. And all the rest of the acts of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of Kings of Israel. So that takes care of that dude, for, for, for at least for, our, for this study. But I get to... Uh, this was the word of the Lord, which he spake unto Jehu, saying, this is a throwback, Thy son shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. See, when Zechariah dies, Israel, the northern kingdom's fifth dynasty came to an end. This ends the Jehu dynasty. He had four generations God had committed to him. That's it. So God, that was predicted back there in chapter 10, verse 30, if you want to you know, track that all down. So Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the ninth and thirtieth year of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And he reigned, guess how long? A full month. No, oh, this is... See, it's a, it's a, it's a turbulent, bloody um, place of intrigue and assassinations. The northern kingdom, uh, that go, when you get into idolatry, all the rest of that, all that uh, violence accompanies it. So Manaheim, the son of Gadi, came, went up from Terza and came to Samaria and smote Shalom, the son of Jabesh in Samaria, and slew him and reigned in his stead. Now we know from Josephus, apparently, that Manahim was the commander and chief of Jeroboam II's army. He was stationed in Terza, the former, it was the former capital of Israel, you may recall, back in the first Kings 15 and following. And he probably regarded Shalom as usurper, of course, and he believed that he as a commander of the uh, army should succeed Zechariah. That was his, uh, you know, logical conclusion. The rest, he, reigned for, he, he reigned for about a month. And the rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy which he made, behold, they are written in the book of Chronicles of Israel. And Manham wrote to, uh, to uh, Tifsa and all that were therein and the coast thereof from Terza, because they opened not to him, therefore he smote it and all the women therein that were with child he ripped up. Now, um, the uh, they didn't acknowledge him as king, so he explained it to he tried to explain it to them a little more clearly. He apparently was intending to intimidate not other Israelite, Israelite towns into supporting him by these rather open atrocities. In the ninth and thirtieth year of Azariah, the king of Judah began Menheim, the son of Gadi, to reign over Israel, and he reigned ten years in Samaria. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. Notice how they always reflect back to the first Jeroboam when they make those remarks, again and again, all through here. And in verse 19, and Paul, as it's laid, laid, uh, labeled here, and Paul, the king of Assyria, came against the land. This is probably Tiglath Pileser III. And uh, he's the very, he's, we identify him from the Assyrian inscriptions. And it helps to unscramble some of the, the chronology. This is, by the way, the first mention of Assyria in 2 Kings. And Paul here, as he's called here in the Bible, is one of Assyria's strongest rulers. And uh, he came against the land, met him, gave Paul a thousand talents of silver and his hand, that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. So he tries to buy his way into this thing. Uh, about a thousand talents, about 37 tons of silver he raised from the wealthy men of Israel. And uh, the Assyrian king gave him uh, support, as you know, as he bought some support here. He exacted the money of Israel, uh, even all the mighty men of wealth of each man, 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. The rest of the acts of Manahem are, uh, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And uh, Manahem slept with his fathers in Pekahiah, 
his son reigned in his stead. In the 50th year of Azariah, the king of Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menahim, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, and he reigned two years. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He parted not from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. I, I, I have tried to stand back from trying to worry too much about the chronology. It's a complicated skein, and that's not really the issue. The real issue is to understand the, the spiritual thread here, it's, and they're going from bad to worse as we go forward here. But Pekah, we're going to talk a little bit about this guy, Pekah. Pekah, the son of Ramalia, a captain of his, conspired against him and smote him in Samaria in the palace of the king's house where Argob and Arya and with him 50 men of Gileadites, and he killed him and reigned in his room. So um, this is, uh, there he's set another assassination. Argob and Arya are probably princes. They were also killed. And this took all took place in what they call the citadel in the most secure part of the palace uh, in Samaria. And he then assumed the throne. He, Pekah has a penchant for scheming. It's going to give rise to some little digression that I'll come to when we, uh, 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 shortly. All the rest of Pekahiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel. In the two and fiftieth year of Azariah, the king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Ramalia, began to reign uh, over Israel in Samaria and reigned twenty years. He did that which was evil inside the Lord, departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, made Israel a sin. And so it goes. Um, in the days of Pekah, the king of Israel came Tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria, and took Ijon and a bunch of other unpronounceable words, uh, well, weighed through all of those, all the land of Naphtali. Many of those you recognize, Hazar, Gilead, Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. This is one of the first deportations. Pekah had taken power in, in, in Samaria. He made a treaty with Rezin, the king of Damascus, against Assyria. But this resulted in Tiglath Pileser uh, leading a campaign and taking over these areas and taking a bunch captive. And this was in about 733 BC. There'll be a second deportation 11 years later that will finish the northern kingdom. So this is the first of two waves, if you will, that wipe out the, the nation. But we're going to move on here for a moment. And Hosea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Amalia, and smote him and slew him and reigned in his stead in the 20th year of the Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Now, uh, this is a sort of a snapshot forward. You're going to get confused if you don't realize this is sort of an editorial, anticipatory uh, description here. And uh, uh, and by the uh, well, there's some, there's some archaeological uh, inscriptions that help support some of this, but let's just keep moving because we're running out of time. And the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. In the second year, Pekah, the son of Ramalia, the king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, to reign. Now we're shifting, we're leaving Pekah, and we're going to talk more about him, even though they've talked about his death. We're going to come back to him and some things that are involved here. We're going to shift, the, the scene shifts now to the southern kingdom, to Judah, and this guy Jotham, who's one of the good guys. In, uh, uh, verse, in verse 33, five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jerusha, the son of Zadok. There's again a co-regency here, because he's going to con he's going to continue as co-regent with his son Ahaz, and, until uh, uh, and, uh, and we're going to get into Ahaz. That's a whole other piece of this. Verse 35, and he, howbeit the high places were not removed. Here it is, that, that, that footnote again. That it doesn't quite cut it. The people sacrificed and burned incense still in all the high places. He built the higher gate, the house of the Lord. Now, all the rest of Jotham, all they did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the uh, kings of Judah? See, he was a good king, but again, he didn't remove the high places. And uh, he did a lot of accomplishments. He rebuilt the upper gate, the north gate, and the temple, uh, to, probably to encourage the uh, worship of, the, of, uh, of Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, other building projects, uh, there's a whole list of them uh, from other, other sources. Anyway, in those days, the Lord began to send against Judah Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia. Now notice what, put yourself in the southern kingdom's point of view. You've got your adversaries, Pekah, the northern kingdom, the son of Ramalia, and you also have just east of them the Syrians or the Aramaeans. Don't confuse them with the Assyrians. They're going to be the dominant guys later. There's going to be an alliance here that I want to talk about a little bit. And anyway, Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried in the, uh, with his father in the city of David, his father. And Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. So we're in the time now of uh, Ahaz, Ahaz in the south, um, Rezin in Syria, and Pekah in uh, the northern kingdom. 
And that leads us to 2 Kings 16. Um, okay. Now this pressure, I think, is probably from the Lord to be a test of faith for the Judean, for Ahaz. God's going to be putting some heat on Ahaz. And uh, this is, we're going to now deal with Ahaz's evil reign in Judah. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, that's in the north, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the king of the Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. So he, he, he goes from bad to worse. It's in Ahaz's day that Isaiah gives us the famous prophecy of the Messiah being born of a virgin, by the way. One of the passages that uh, sort of uh, should be read in parallel here is Isaiah chapter 7, for some reasons that uh, may surprise you. I'll explain in just a minute. Um, but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom. Bad news. Yea, and made his son to pass through the fire. That's a heinous thing. He uh, uh, sacrificed his son. Obviously not Hezekiah, who was a son that would rule later. But uh, as a burnt offering. He offers his son as a burnt offering to an idol. Can you imagine? And this was common practice among the Ammonites and other native pagan Can uh, Canaanite nations uh, that uh, Joshua had partially at least driven out of the land. And... Uh, he sacrificed the Bernite instance to the high places and on the hills and under every green tree, which is an expression like, like saying everywhere. Then Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Amalia, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war. And they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. They're trying to get Ahaz to join them because they're trying to build a confederacy of the north, south, and the Syrians against uh, Assyria. But it's not working. Now, by the way, one of the questions, I'm going to pause here and just insert a little something. One of the co controversial questions, are there hidden codes in the Bible? And most people, when you deal with this, talk about the equidistant letter sequence thing that's become very controversial out of books Bibles. I'm not going to even talk about that. There's something different. I want to call your attention to Proverbs 25 too, and it is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the honor or duty, if you will, of kings to search out a matter. In Isaiah chapter 7, there's some comments about this there. It says, It came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, went up towards Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. That sounds like the verse we just read, isn't it? And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved in the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. In other words, he, this shook him up. This shook... This, then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shirjashab, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not. Neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Ramalia. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of who? Tibel, or Tibel. Tibel. Now there's an interesting problem here. Who is the son of Tibel? Where you, go search that if you like. Most people say it's an it's a epithet of some kind. I'll come back to that. Turns out, if you take that word Tibel, and uh, you, your sources here are no, is actually the Midrash Rabbah on Numbers uh, 1821, believe it or not. It turns out there's a form of, there are three different kinds of classic encryptions in the Old Testament. I'm not talking about, and I'm not talking about equidistant letter sequences. One is called Albam. If you take the Hebrew alphabet and you um, write it, write it out, and write the second half backwards under it you have a, a, a opportunity to do transpositions. And if you take uh, Isaiah 7, 6, the word tabil in the Hebrew, and you substitute, you find the letter and substitute its matching pair, that's called albam. It's named albam because of the first four letters of this concept. Aleph, Lamed, Bet, Mem. It's, it, it, albam is taking the first four letters of this scheme and pronouncing it. And what you do is you take the first letter and uh, substitute the resh for it, and you take the other one, you just, follow that, you just follow that pattern all the way through, taking each letter in the Hebrew and transposing it, you end up with Ramallah. So what this encryption reveals, the plan was that if they had succeeded, that the one that would be the guy, the, the greet upon boss, was Pekah, the king of Ramallah. The son, excuse me, the son of Ramallah, 
how the son of Tobiel, son of Mali, it's encrypted. Not a big deal, especially since their plot doesn't work anyway. That's not the point. I think it's profoundly significant that there are encryptions in the Old Testament. Now, if you're a student of cryptography in CIA or NSA or someplace, it's well known. These are three famous encryptions in the Bible. There's three, there's three different models. Um, another one happens to be Atbash. It's, that's, that's if you take the second half and reverse it and then do the same game in Jeremiah 25 and 51. The word Shishak turns out to be encryption of uh, Babel. And uh, in Jeremiah 51, uh, the heart of my enemy, it turns out to be the Chaldeans. Not a big deal. And to a student of cryptography, just it's in a historical oddity. But for someone who understands the Bible has a supernatural origin, the presence of encryptions are signposts. It's what the rabbis called a remez or a hint, a hint of something deeper. So I've mentioned that in passing because it comes up in our text historically. I won't belabor it. I just wanted you to at least be aware of it. And of course, there's references you can get into if you're interested in that. Let's move on. So Ahaz sent messengers to take police of the king of Syria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. Now Ahaz does a stupid thing. Isaiah just told him that God's going to protect him, but instead what he does, he, it's a form of unbelief. He goes to Assyria to, make a, to get help. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasure of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. He's trying to get a very powerful partner to keep these other characters at bay. The king of Assyria hearkened unto him, and for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it and carried the people of it captive to Kir and slew Rezin. That takes care of that problem. And the king Ahaz went to Damascus to meet tiglath pileser the king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was in at Damascus. And the king Ahaz sent to Urijah the priest the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it to, according to all the workmanship. So Ahaz went to Damascus. He's so impressed with his altar that he has one made just like it. In, and he, how do you think that went over with God? Pretty upset, of course. Urijah built, uh, a priest built an altar according to all that king Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So, Urijah the police made it against the king of Ahaz, uh, uh, came from Damascus. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached the altar and offered thereon. And he burnt his burnt offering and his meat offering and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings upon the altar. And he brought also the brazen altar, which was before the Lord, and from the forefront of the house and from between the altar and the house of the Lord and put it on the north side of the altar. And King Ahaz commanded Urijah the priest, saying, Upon the great altar burn the morning burnt offering and the evening meat offering and king's burnt sacrifice as meat offering and the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their meat offering and their drink offerings and sprinkle upon it the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire by. So this all sounds, you know, you could argue, well, gee, he means it's good intentions. No, he's not following God's directions. And that's important. Thus Urijah the police did according to all that King Ahaz commanded, and King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases and removed the labor from off of them, took down the sea, that's this big wash thing, wash basin, off from off the brazen oxen, remember the 12 oxen, we talked about that before, that were under it, and put it upon a pavement of stones. And the covert for the Sab Sabbath that they had, that they had built in the house and the king's entry without, turned he from the house of the Lord uh, for the king of Assyria. So he took these basins from the 10 bronze movable standards that was mentioned in 1 Kings 7. He removed the massive bronze base from under the molten sea that we talked about in 1 Kings 7 and uh, substituted a stone stand. Then he took down the Sabbath canopy, apparently some kind of covering that was erected in the courtyard to shade the king as they visited the temple. And he removed the royal uh, entryway outside the temple. And we don't know what he did with all these. It's not clear what he did with all these things that he took. But anyway, he willingly disobeyed God is the real point behind all of this stuff. And uh, we, as we go on, you know, we, we can lose sight of our own selves here. Do we compromise God's instructions in our behavior? Boy, I'm sure we do. Do we compromise instructions for fear of offending the pagan neighbors? That's what he's doing here. He's trying to gain favor with the king of Assyria. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaz, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. One thing I might mention, that passage in Isaiah 7 that we just touched on to get the encryption thing out, It's a, it, that was up to about verse 4 or 5, 6, 7, whatever. It's verse 14 of chapter 7 where God tells Ahaz, ask me a sign. No, I won't ask for a sign. He wouldn't do that. And he says, well, God will give you a sign. That's where you get the prophecy of the virgin birth. And uh, 
and people quibble about the Hebrew of that. It was translated in the Greek by the Hebrew commentators three centuries before Christ was born, and the term in the Greek is very clear. We're talking about a virgin birth. Anyway, Ahaz slept with his fathers and was buried in the, with his fathers in the city of David, and Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, Hezekiah is a good guy. And uh, in fact, he's such a good guy, we're going to spend a good portion of the next session on that. So let's, uh, uh, at this point, uh, take a break.